and Investment Banking, Standard Bank Namibia, Mr. Yuan Nell, Corporate Tax Partner, PricewaterhouseCoopers Namibia, Ms. Naufiku Hamunime, Head of Ecosystems and Business Development, Standard Bank Namibia, various captains of industry present here today, viewers of all the online platforms, particularly those of NTV, distinguished members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, greetings and welcome to the Namibian Budget 2022-2023 Dissect, themed Reform to Grow. My name is Denver Kisting. We are delighted to have you and thank you very much for your presence at this event. We don't have many house rules other than that we need to remember that we are still towards the end of a global pandemic. So let's be mindful of our own health and well-being and that of our fellow Namibians. The, the restrooms are in that black dwelling at the back. If you all just have a look in that direction, if you need to go, that's where you need to head. Without further ado, Uncle Robin Sharma teaches us that one seizes the day at five o'clock in the morning. A gentleman who lives and embraces this par excellence, who when many of us are still fast asleep, already conquers a morning run and strategizes how to go about corporate and investment banking. This gentleman goes by the name of Mr. Nelson Lucas. Let's give him a round of applause. Nelson Lucas, Head of Corporate Investment Banking, Standard Bank Namibia, please join us in front, sir, for the word of welcoming. Another round of applause, please. Yeah, they're going to have to, I think, lift up the mic a little bit for me. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you guys can all hear me clearly. Uh, Mr. James Munepe, Presidential Economic Advisor. Mr. Sham Subute, NAMRA Commissioner and other delegation of Ministry of Finance. Ms. Chantal Hasselman, Country Senior Partner of PwC Namibia. Ms. Monique Kluter, Managing Director of Liberty Life Namibia. Mr. Albi Buerta, Chief Executive Officer of Namibia Media Holdings, Ms. Mercia Gases, Chief Executive of Standard Bank Namibia, fellow captains of industry, esteemed guests, valued clients, distinguished stakeholders, members of the media, all protocol observed. A warm welcome from Standard Bank Namibia together with PwC Namibia, Namibia Media Holdings, and Liberty Life Namibia to this Namibia Budget Review breakfast event. My name is Nelson Lucas, and I'm the Head of Corporate and Investment Banking at Standard Bank Namibia. These are indeed exciting times, and what a way to start off the year with some positive outlook for 2022, and also the Namibian budget that was tabled yesterday by Minister of Finance, Honorable Ipumbushimi, which was themed reimagining a better future for the youth. Unfortunately, we have to acknowledge the uncertainty that the world economy would be facing due to the developments that has taken place over the last day or so in Eastern Europe. 
it is also a time for us as a country to appreciate the peace and stability we have enjoyed over the years. The Ukrainian people would agree that, uh, that we are indeed very, very fortunate. Taking our main theme into account around economic growth, I thought it best for us to look at Singapore as an example. In the 1960s, the city-state of Singapore was, undeveloped, was an undeveloped country with a GDP per capita of less than 320 US dollars. Today, its GDP per capita has risen to an incredible 60,000 US dollars, making it one of the strongest economies in the world. For a small country with few natural resources, Singapore's economic rise is nothing short of remarkable. By embracing globalization, free market capitalism, education, and pragmatic policies, the country has been able to uh, overcome its geographic uh, disadvantages and become a leader in global commerce. The question still remains, how did they do it? Industrialization with a labor focus was quite key, which obviously addressed the unemployment situation that they had. Strong trade agreements with several countries were put in place to ensure that exportation of manufactured goods were done so in a manner that benefited both themselves and the countries on the receiving end. Amendments to policies to make it an investment-friendly environment with the intention to ensure that these investments were utilized towards education, specifically in the technical school space, unskilled workers in technology, petrochemicals, and electronics was also um, an intention by them. Uh, they have the world's busiest transshipment port, which took a lot of planning, time, as well as investment. There are quite a number of lessons we can learn from Singapore. With the prospects that we have as a country, I can only get excited about the land of the brave. With the travel restrictions that have been removed, this is definitely a plus for us as it opens up the opportunities for a good recovery within our tourism sector. Mining presents a lot of opportunities with certain commodity prices um, reaching highs, as well as the diamond prospects and expectations are looking very positive, taking into account a few significant developments um, that have um, taken place recently. And let me not get on to green hydrogen ambitions, as well as our oil discoveries, which has really got us very excited as a nation. The future really does look bright for Namibia. The question is whether we can capitalize on these opportunities and the prospects that present themselves. We definitely would have to be very smart about it, and one way we would be, one way to look at it is to really look at our partnerships um, that we have to form at various levels. So to both the public and the private sector, the challenge is now. The challenge is on, sorry. How about now? we look towards becoming the next economic powerhouse of Africa and ultimately the world. As we at Standard Bank truly believe that it can be. Once again, it is an honor to welcome you all to this Namibia Budget Review Breakfast event. Thank you very much. He deserves another round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Remember what I told you, while the rest of us are still asleep, this man already runs and strategizes. I want to also concur with Mr. Lucas that despite the prevailing global, continental, regional, and domestic uncertainty, there is indeed a lot of hope and a lot of excitement. And the challenge is on for all of us in both the public and the private space. The question that he asks, how about now? I want to say yes. How about a yes for that? Is that a yes? Very well. I have encountered a number of incredibly eloquent human beings in my life. But I'm yet to encounter an eloquent human being of the caliber of the following gentleman. 
He's a committed soldier. He's a super dedicated public servant. He's here for the people. He's our green hydrogen commissioner. And moreover, he's the economic advisor in the presidency. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a round of applause to Mr. James Newpe. you like you're going into a heavyweight title in Las Vegas. I'm like, and I'm going up against the guy who runs from five o'clock in the morning. So <laughs> I don't think the odds are in my favor. Um, but yeah, so thank you so much for having me this morning and uh, for inviting me to come and talk to you all about growth opportunities in Namibia. Um, obviously, the budget yesterday told us that we are in very trying times, um, but as articulated by Nelson and our MC, there are opportunities for us to put on our innovative uh, problem-solving hats um, and really attacking this pro uh, pro problem hold on. So I was jotting a few um, points down to share with you today, so I'm not gonna read a speech, I'm gonna have a conversation with you guys if that's okay. Um, and I thought I'd, st oh, by the way, protocol, all protocols observed, right? Because I think Nelson, and the previous speaker have done it two times over, so please, Sam uh, Shivut in the likes. <laughs> I, I respect all of you guys. Um, but I was reading a report by PSG, so they, they wrote a report on, on our debt situation, and of course they spent a lot of time covering all of the, uh, the amount of debt that we owe, um, the cost of debt ETC, which was very important. But towards the end of that report, they started looking at a few scenarios. Um, and, and I thought it's very useful for us. We obviously look at the budget um, you know, over the MTEV, um, but they were looking at scenarios that say, look, if we continue to grow our revenue at 1.2% per annum, our expense is at 0.9%, and our, and our interest cost is at 7.3%, which is what the past five years looked like. Um, and I quote, the low revenue growth and the very small spread between revenue and the expense line uh, growth means that the debt will just keep on growing at over 10% per year. So long story short, that is not a sustainable outcome for us as Namibians, right? Um, and while we can spend time looking at all of the cool things that Tata Shimio was doing yesterday, including with the Pumbu Shimi FC, which is what Nelson and the likes were going to do, I, I wanted us to focus on just really three things. Um, one is the fact that, of course, we're going to need to prudently manage our expenses, and I think that's what the Minister of Finance is already doing fairly well, at least to the best he can, while still not negating our social sort of infrastructure needs. Um, but there are two things that we'd need to do, right? We'd need to grow our revenue, and we'd really need to proactively manage our cost of funding, right? And so I wanted to share with you today a few things that we're trying to do at government to grow that revenue and to proactively manage um, our cost of capital. And then I'd, <clears throat> I'd actually really then like to invite a lot of you guys um, to problem solve for those solutions with us. Because when I sat next to Na Naofiko, she said, so, you know, you're doing some great stuff, thank you. And she said, so, like, what's the size of your team? And then I couldn't help but just laugh, right? So our team is not big. Um, government does not have a significant amount of human resources. And as you know, our wage bill is quite large. Um, and it's, it's going to stay flat for a few years. So it's the first time in a while that... Um, my salary hasn't increased um, by inflation or anything at all, but of course my expenses are going up and that's the reality for a lot of government workers and we don't expect that to change. So we're gonna need to collaborate and work with all of you in the private sector to get going. So, so let's try and attack this item um, with regards to revenue growth. So what we're doing as government is we are actually gonna be holding a, a biannual cabinet retreat. The first one should be around March the 11th and we're taking a few sort of items from the economic advancement pillar in HPP2 and others, and we're trying to prioritize them in order to get you know, revenue going, to get infrastructure development going, and to crowd in funding from other sources. And, and I thought I'd share with you practical examples of what we're thinking to get your creative juices flowing, and you can always email and text me afterwards of other things you think we should be looking at. Obviously, NIPDB is doing a lot of things to um, unlock new investment opportunities and attract people into Namibia. They've put together a productivity task force with the Harvard Growth Lab. 
Um, and that productivity task force is actually looking to deal with key people in the private sector, looking at, say, at the moment, they're looking at agriculture, grapes, and high-value fruits as well. And then they're looking at what are the key hindrances to really growing that sector very quickly to increase exports and to attract new FDI. So that particular proactive um, effort by NIPDB would obviously need um, more private sector involvement, but it is an example of a government um, trying to not just be passive about letting um, the economy grow. Um, once you put in specific reforms, which is what we're being asked. We, you know, people are saying, cut some tax rates, maybe get rid of NIB and NIPA, and then the economy will grow. And we think the, there's a requirement for more proactive partnership, other than just putting in place very much needed um, uh, private sector reform. Then we start getting into some of the things that we're doing that, that are actually looking to create a whole new industry, for example. So. As some of you know, of course, we've been trying to incubate a synthetic fuels industry. I think the, the short, catchy word is green hydrogen, but I'd really love to encourage us today to think about what we're trying to do with that particular, it's goal three, activity two of the economic advancement pillar. Um, so green hydrogen, of course, is uh, essentially an industry or it's a product, but the synthetic fuels industry um, that we want to incubate essentially has about seven buckets, which we've tried to explain before, but I'll, I'll explain them briefly here today as well. So there's obviously wind generation, solar generation, transmission, desalination, and all of those so far, we actually do in Namibia already, right? And then there's the electrolyzer, ammonia production, and ammonia storage. So as we started bring, bringing this particular new opportunity into Namibia, um, one of the things we obviously have to do is put together an enabling legislation. So we're going to be working with NAMRA um, and, and the uh, tax policy people um, at the Ministry of Finance to put in place a competitive um, legislative regime and a tax regime to really make our green hydrogen competitive. But I can see ex-tax colleagues at uh, PwC that I used to work with, and we would love to work with them to make sure that whatever legislative environment we're putting in place is super competitive, right? Because this particular industry, if you look at what the US is doing to make their relatively expensive hydrogen cheap using post-tax credits, it's very clear to us that we're gonna need to do a lot of global research to make sure that our um, legislative environment is conducive. Let's take, for example, uh, a transmission bucket. Um, the early estimates we got is that the developers would like to spend 1.7 billion building out transmission lines. In Namibia, we have probably the best transmission builder on the whole continent, and when you speak to them on a good day, they believe they're the best transmission builder in the world, certainly one of the most cost effective. Uh, and they're in the crowd here somewhere, no two guesses where they may be, but they are on this table. So if you're the government, you should have very early constructive uh, conversations with people like Powerline Africa to understand if we're gonna build this amount of transmission in Namibia, where are we gonna source the labor? How do we de-risk um, the uh, ordering of metal? And not just we, but working with the private sector. What do you do with your customs duties and your excise duties, right? So that sort of proactive public sector, private sector collaboration to problem solve for some of these opportunities we think are very important to really maximize the opportunity to, um, to grow the economy. So one of the things I did want to come out here and say today is, you know, government has done the first leg, which is we theorized it. We then went around the world and canvassed for support, and, and now things are happening, right? We launched a new pilot project, about 300 million on Tuesday. After this, I have to zip to, to State House to launch a 680 million Namibian dollar program. A 2.5 billion euro uh, asset was announced as well this week. And of course, we're working on this much larger asset, which is potentially $9 billion in the Karas region. So that's a synthetic fuels industry in a very, very, very small nutshell. It's a lot more complicated than that. And there are a lot more diverse growth opportunities that we would love to, to talk about. So I say to um, now Fika, we'd love to work with a team of private sector economists to actually model the direct and of course the induced opportunities uh, from a job perspective, from a social accounting matrix perspective, ETC. But enough about that. One of the other things we are trying to do as a government is to realize that 
what we're trying to do in Namibia is not something that only we want to do. Um, countries around the world would like to partner with us as we look to build our economy, including as we look to decarbonize, um, obviously, our economy and the regional economy as well. So we've started working, for example, quite proactively with the European Union Commission, and they have an initiative called the Global Gateway Initiative. Um, it's a 150 billion euro package for African countries to help us build infrastructure, telecommunication related assets, and of course, en uh, renewable energy related assets. And what that particular um, uh, initiative entails is not just concessionary funding, but things like grant funding, um, they'll help us structure, for example, um, you know, fixed income instruments, ETC. So it de-risks project development in Namibia. And why I'm mentioning this today is not only does the government have to work with private sector, which is all of you here, but we're also working with regional and, um, and, and international peers in order to crowd in funding that goes way beyond Tatashimi's you know, $70 billion budget when he has like a 50 something or a 60 something mil billion dollar revenue line, right? And crowding in new funding into Namibia from multiple sources is one of the key ways that we'll get that revenue line ticking faster than the expense line so that we can really contract that deficit much faster than, than we can. So we had a team of EU professionals here yesterday um, and I'm pretty excited to say that, you know, they're trying to work with the Namibian government to start structuring, for example, a potential green bond for us, but also to really start bringing to life something we've articulated in HPP2 called an integrated national financing framework. And long story short, that entails deploying a blended financing approach to funding your infrastructure and developmental needs, right? So you want to go out there into the world and proactively source, yes, concessionary capital, grants, but even guarantees from you know, institutions like the EIB, the European Investment Bank or other DFIs. When you do that, what you start attacking is what PSG has obviously identified as a key issue, our interest expense line item, right? That's about 15% of our revenue. It's just going into interest, okay? Sort of our average cost of debt, if you look at our interest expense relative to our total cost uh, to, or to our total debt, is about 7%. So how do you proactively attack that line item and either start bringing it down or certainly at least mitigating its growth while you're still trying to issue debt to build the key infrastructure that you need to get GDP going? We're going to need to build some really interesting port infrastructure. There's some rail infrastructure that we want to build. There's some green schemes that we want to build, right? And you can't just put that on Tatashimi's um, normal debt right at the top. So, you know, the NSX is going to start working with the Luxembourg Stock Exchange. You know, as the Minister of Finance and the Central Bank get the CSD going, we're going to work with the EU to start crowding in investors that want to invest in Namibian debt, whether it's normal debt, uh, green bonds, sustainability bonds, or social bonds. And then you start to introduce a much greater level of liquidity and depth of your capital market. And if you're really finding attractive assets, you can start actually attacking that cost of debt, um, which is a very key important factor that, that we were looking at. So these are some of the key things that we wanted to work on. One of the things I wanted to mention though are, you know, who are the private sector people that we're already working with? And, and, and how can we crowd in more, right? So um, you, know, you guys all know that Bank Vinduk, for example, have, have listed the sustainability bond. Um, I think, you know, Standard Bank would like to do something similar. Nedbank, you know, they'd all like to work with us to look at not just bonds, but what other type of instruments could we use to raise new sources of funding. I, mean, I can tell you now, we're already working on um, carbon credits as well. And we're working with blockchain technology to try and actually capture the level of emissions that we're reducing by building certain assets. That could be a potential new source of revenue. And as you can imagine, that's a very complex undertaking that I'm sure some of you are probably better equipped to help us put together than, 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 than we can ourselves. The EIF is an interesting institution. Um, I think companies like Powerline Africa, Hopsol, ONL Next Century, you can see ONL has already partnered with um, CMB and they're beginning to build out some of this infrastructure. 
Of course, the oil is a very interesting opportunity and people like Manika and many other companies in Namibia, um, of course, would know how to potentially try and exploit that opportunity. So long story short, um, from my side, if, if somebody was to ask me what are the growth opportunities um, for Namibia, the growth opportunities um, actually are sitting underneath this amazing tree, right? It is really the intellectual capital and prowess that Namibia has across both perceived divides, right? You have to get the public sector working very proactively with the private sector, and we have to put on, if we can, please, a very proud Namibian hat, right? And if we push, if you look at what Rwanda is doing, um, I mean, the state has a very proactive role in trying to forge a vision and a destiny that all Rwandans are, are converging around. Singapore wasn't that much different, right? They had a very charismatic leader as well. And so I think, unfortunately, in Namibia, so far it has been, you know, government is trying to do something and the private sector is watching and they're saying, you can do better, and then government is saying, but you should get involved. Um, so for me personally, while I'm still here, hopefully for the next three years, I would absolutely love to narrow that divide and, and we should get to work on making these growth opportunities that have articulated very quickly um, work um, as effectively um, and as, as, as hastily as possible. And if, if, if you guys are okay with it, I'd love to actually start now. So like in March, I've asked Albi to put together a group of seven to 10 CEOs, some members of the media, um, and I'd love to actually invite you guys to State House, and I'd love to us, uh, for us to actually sit down and have the practical version of this conversation, a Namibian problem-solving um, session where I can show you some of the information or some of the details that we're working on. Even if some of them are fairly confidential, we can sign an NDA, but then it allows you as private sector to go back home and actually start thinking about how do I potentially deploy risk capital um, after these opportunities as they begin to manifest. Um, you know, because the last thing I will say, for example, with the big um, hydrogen project in the south, the colleagues are looking to deploy or to start mobilizing, um, you know, whether it's labor or key resources by sort of early 2024. Um, but in terms of mapping the resources needed to be deployed before you start construction in 2025, that exercise is actually happening right now. So they're already here. They're in Walvis Bay today. They're talking to the port, ETC. What I'd love to start doing is engendering a conversation between them and you, between the EU and the Minister of Finance, which is what we did last night, um, and between all the other different parties that want to actually work with Namibia as well. So I do hope when Albi gives your call, you'll answer that phone call because um, we'd be inviting you to a really interesting session with like cool pieces of Lego and um, we hope to build a really cool Namibian house. This is why I don't do protocol. Uh, you know, we, we can build a really cool Namibian house uh, from that session and then start growing the economy. I think that's my take on how we can do that. Thanks guys, appreciate it. This is what happens when you do praise him for running at five o'clock in the morning. Okay, cool. Thanks, man. Appreciate it so much. Cheers. I think Mr. Nupe deserves another round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know how familiar many of us are with the weather conditions in Luderitz. By a show of hands, how familiar are we with what happens in Ludwitz? Not many, it would appear. I was, I was there last weekend, and the wind there is pretty serious. The Buchtas are over that wind. But I have to say to you, Mr. Nupe does hold the potential and the capacity to package and sell wind from Ludwitz to those very Buchtas and call it synthetic energy. Well done, James. It's no doubt that the Namibian government has its work cut out for it in terms of continuously creating and capacitating a conducive legislative and policy environment. Commissioner Shivuti, I'd also like to acknowledge your presence, you and your team. Thank you very much for also for the great work that, that you guys are doing. I would also like us to heed Mr. Nupe's call to put on our proudly Namibian hats 
and hats that are of an innovative and a problem-solving nature. We'll take a short break, but we'll be right back. Do stay tuned. While Namibia and its cities are seen as one of the cleanest countries in Africa, plastic pollution is a big problem. Therefore, it's up to each of us to do what we can to reduce the use of plastic, especially single-use plastic bags. At Liberty Life Namibia, we've taken the decision to turn all our old branding items into reusable shopping bags. We were taught that one plus one equals two. Simple, right? But today's world isn't simple. So what happens if we look at it from a new angle? Could we make something greater? If we bring together human ingenuity, passion, and experience with the latest technology, we start to make something more. Something we can see in people's lives and feel in the world around them. Building trust for today and tomorrow. And that's the thing. We all know the math. But we need a new way to put it together. Which means we don't just find answers. We never stop looking for them. A passionate community of solvers. Coming together in unexpected ways. Creating new solutions for a new day. That's 
the new equation. No matter the time, there's a way to keep it cashless and pay with PayPal instead. Start your day the cashless way. No electricity for your morning cup, no stress. Just grab your phone and PayPal has got you back and brewing in seconds. Out of the house and need to fill up with no cash? No problem with PayPal, because now you're paying cashless on the go. Then it's a quick visit for car wash and kapana, and now you don't need anything more than your phone to pay. Or just sort out your TV subscription the cashless way and chill out on the couch at home. And whether you're paying for medicine, groceries, or just your municipal bills at the end of the month, why not make it more convenient with PayPal instead? For every day and a million other reasons, isn't it time you went cashless and changed the way you pay? Download the PayPal app or dial star 140 star 6626 hash on your phone to get started. PayPal, change the way you pay. Welcome back. This is the 2022-2023 Namibian budget dissect themed reform to grow. For a panel discussion about what transpired in the National Assembly yesterday with the Minister of Finance, Ms. Pumbushimi, tabled the budget, I'm joined by Ms. Chantal Hesseman. She is the country's senior partner and tax leader at PricewaterhouseCoopers. Mr. Yuanel, corporate tax partner, also at PricewaterhouseCoopers Namibia. Ms. Nofiko Aminime, head of ecosystems and business development, Standard Bank Namibia, as well as Ms. Monique Kluter, managing director of Liberty Life. Greetings and welcome. Thank you, Denver. Thank you. Very well. Um, Let's please start with you, Ms. Hesselman. At first glance, what are some of the key highlights of yesterday's budget speech? Thank you, Denver, and good morning to our audience as well. I think this morning, seated here, we have the, the, a very beautiful view, the best view. Um, if you, with a busy executive in mind, if you haven't had time to sit with a cup of coffee or tea and dissect the budget and form own views thereof, please rest, rest assured that post our um, high-level 20-minute dissect from between myself and, and my colleague, Johan, you should be able to be well-informed and part of the conversation. So the budget was themed reimagining a better future for the youth and also supporting that depicted by the minister. We are hosting the event and every coverage we have in terms of the budget dissect under the, our own theme uh, between the co-sponsor parties of reforming for growth as well. So a lot of us in the audience, I would say definitely between the co-sponsor parties, we employ um, a young workforce and can definitely identify with the need in terms of attracting talent, developing talent, retaining talent on a daily basis. So the speech did give some context to if there is um, announced incentive or activities or specific focuses on developing the youth. The context given to us is um, the youth demographics as per recent NSA statistics. Um, where it is depicted 33% of the total Namibian, the current um, numbers on total num population, are between aged 15 and 34. Yesterday I found myself already in terms of questions, so um, what do we regard as youth? And it might be that that is the age profile to, to look at and consider. Unfortunately, Johan, you and I are now out of that range officially. <laughs> Then um, also another um, alarming but important statistic given to us is that the census indicates um, circa 44% of that age group 
lives in rural areas, also stressing the need in terms of creating employment and reaching out countrywide and making sure things happen outside the city of Vantuk. Um, and lastly, um, quite eye-opener to myself, is the forecast that by 2027, the expected um, growth um, would play out that more than a million of the Namibian population at the time would be in that age profile. So definitely speaking to the needs of action needed um, on how we take Namibia forward and take a long-term view on that. So besides the focus on the youth, Denver, the budget also did speak to um, employment creation, more, of more, of the more on that later. Uh, but diving into putting some action to, uh, to the intent, um, the minister was not shy in putting, it, putting in specific initiatives. I've brought along a couple of them, so these are amongst others. Um, where it would be an effort between the Del Development Bank of Namibia, Agribank, um, in terms of loan funding, uh, with specific criteria coming with that, looking at the need of student accommodation, exploring uh, student village options as well, um, speaking to cultivating local sport talent, um, I had my 16-year-old send me, about 4.30 yesterday, he sent me a WhatsApp, Mommy, is it true the Independence Stadium will be upgraded? Mm. And I could proudly reply, yes, Puti, it's true. Mm. So, yeah, so then we have, um <coughs> sorry, Denver, so then we have VTC centers. As we speak, I think yesterday we were given the numbers in terms of current grade, um, um, or last year grade 11s that, as we speak, should have been in, traditional classroom setups, that's this morning um, for various reasons, not yet the case, and uh, giving, getting the needed attention. So if that is the outflow of the average 17, 18 year old, um, definitely much needed focus should be placed on expanding VTC centers and um, enhancing local entrepreneurship in order to take up that the youth that is a uh, one year younger when they done with the, when they complete their, their high school school schooling. Um, yes, Denver, I think I would stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very comprehensive overview, Ms. Hesselman. Would you like to just capture for us perhaps the biggest policy changes that were announced yesterday? Yes. So some of the announcement is the first time of having the opportunity to be included in the national gov uh, budget mentioned. For example, the exact figure to seat the establishment of the Sovereign Wealth Fund um, to be titled the Velvicia Fund and has been communicated to us to be um, also under the administration of the Bank of Namibia. Um, uh, also mentioned was, for example, that in a response to the emergency funding initiatives that was rolled out um, while the, the pandemic was um, um, the pandemic impact was felt in the hardest hit sectors of the economy. So um, the outplay was that the funding availed, for example, via DBN was not taken up at um, execution levels as envisaged. And that also brings about the need of establishing a pilot rescue fund. So once the initiative depicted under the, the, the intent is, is found viable, more will be shared with us around about the mid-year budget speech where we can look forward to um, how, that, how that will work and how it um, speaks to uh, supporting entrepreneurship as well. Then the mention of various policies, which the audience should be familiar with by now. For example, I've brought along um, finalizing the Public Procurement Amendment Bill, the National Housing Policy, uh, the State Asset Ownership Policy, and also Central Securities Depository, which I think should be gazetted soon, as, as mentioned by the speech. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Hesselman. Mr. Nell. There cannot be a dispute about the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly the regulations that in part remain in force to curb the further spread of COVID-19. One of the concerns in the previous budget related to our national debt, and I heard Mr. Newpier concede earlier that about 15% of our revenue goes towards the servicing of such debt. What does the picture look like from your expert perspective? It's good to be back with a, with a real audience. I just want to <laughs> acknowledge that. We were used to staring into a screen and a green screen behind mm. us, so it's, it's nice to see people. Um, 
as uh, James alluded to as well, we, we can see the picture is, is changing. Uh, we were at 67 percent last year. That's going up to about 71 percent now. Um, what's even more worrying is that in the mid-year budget speech, uh, the expectation is that this will increase to about 74 percent. So it's, it's a real problem, and I think the minister also said that it, it's one of the key considerations and key, key sort of things that, that we need to change. Um, we agree with everything that James said, and we believe that the only way to really get out of this is in terms of, of new economic growth, new projects into the country. Um, and when one thinks about generating more tax revenue, I think it's important to not only look at, at the tax rate in terms of our tax rate is 32%. Um, if we take the example that Nelson said about, about Singapore as well, the moment that you drop the, the rate for, for, for income tax, for instance, and it attracts additional investment, yes, you may lose 3 or 4% in terms of your income tax revenue, but the knock-on effect of that, of mm -hmm. people entering the country for a new project, the payroll taxes that arise from that, from new em employment opportunities, those people spend at local shops, it got, it's got a massive knock-on effect, it's difficult to measure, but it has a massive impact on the economy. So, so it's something that we definitely agree with, and, and we, we always try to motivate in our um, submissions towards the Ministry of Finance that we have to take the long-term view, the bigger picture view, because that's the only way we're going to solve this problem. Uh, as you can see, there's a 12.3% 12, 12 increase in debt just from, from the current year to the prior year. Um, and, and as long as we stay in, in a deficit, uh, which, which we'll get to a bit later, that number is not going to change. Uh, we're going to keep lending and lending to fund ourselves. Mm. Now, being able to see the bigger picture also requires a lot of visionary leadership. Um, to get to the hope that Mr. Newper also touched on, please talk to us about our revenue projections versus the expenditure. So if you, if you look at the picture we've, we've got on screen now, um, there is a projected increase in the revenue, about uh, six billion, so that, that's a, a nice increase. And, and Chantel will, will dive into the detail of what that entails. But as we can see, we're ending up with about 60 billion in revenue, but 70, close to 71 billion in expenses. So we, we're still in a deficit. At least this deficit is coming down. Uh, but there's some once-off items there that, that's increasing our revenue. And, and as I said, Chant Chantel will dive into that. But, but this is the overall picture. So, so we, we're in that deficit. We need to get out of it. Um, there's lots of plans to be made, and, and, and we're excited that we can, as well, partner with government in, in how, how we can take this forward. Mm. So, uh, so my Commissioner Shivut and his team, they're present here today, and I'd like to hear from you, how will we foot our bills? Where will we actually get the revenue from? Um, yes, so thanks for that. So I must say, I tried to recall a year where we had a similar scenario, and my memory couldn't I couldn't find a memory of such. So once off, or uh, not for me to say, but what we experienced this year is that the growth in um, budgeted revenue stemming from non-tax revenue. So historically, in, in terms of the composition, the pie chart that we have, the, the t uh, total revenue composition would um, non-tax revenue historically would have been 5 6% of total revenue. So for this year, we have the steep jump to 16% of total revenue. Um, and just some background to that is also, as announced by the speech, um, the budgeted dividends to be received, mention made of combined between NPTH, um, NAMDIA as well as NAMDEP holdings um, and then that obviously uh, doubled with the um, earnings from the listing of the MTC shares um, given to us at this stage of 2.5 billion mm -hmm. and that speaks to the jump from 6% to 16% in, s in, in terms of, of non-tax revenue. So that does leave tax revenue uh, budgeted as um, uh, at a flat rate year-on-year year comparison, a flat increase. So, um, Johan, if we just move along into, so what, so what is the outlay now in terms of budgeted tax revenue? So, again, um, we're quite used to having the customs composition to total, bu uh, to budgeted revenue well above 30%. Um, so, budgeted for this uh, fiscal year to drop to 28%. Um, and then... Um, one or two percent deviations between um, the other taxes that we have, between VAT, income tax, and um, corporate tax, depicted at 14 percent last year, now budgeted at 15 percent. 
So it does show to me um, extremely high dependency in terms of keeping the, the employment that we have. So no further significant rise in unemployment because what I see is a high dependency on households' ability and contributing to that 29% budgeted pay-as-you-earn, as we call it, for the same household would need to make sure I am employed or self-employed to have a contribution towards my pay-as-you-earn so that I can take my after-tax pay, um, uh, take-home pay and spend it on local VAT-inclusive goods and services. Mm. Because that brings us to more than half of the budgeted tax revenue. So please note, Monday is second provisional payment. Please file those, if not yet. Um, and also note that um, it's the end of tax year for individuals, so please file the returns by the 30th of June. We, we, we the, the numbers is it's speaking to us. We, we brought it along bright and colorful this morning so that we can see the dependency. The, the, the SACO revenue is not what it used to be. So I think my next slide, Johan, touch on that. So for years that I've been fortunate to be part of this dissect is we've always talked about our dependency on the SACO revenue and, and what if that dropped. So the if happened, it mm. dropped. So for um, reasons which I think we did not foresee at the time when we talked about it, obviously accelerated by the impact of the pandemic on international global trade, but also local um, imports or, or SACO trade with the rest of the world. So we all know there is a time lag between having the economic activity, having an inflow into the pool, and when Namibia is entitled to our share of the pool. So th we're currently in that stage where it, it's playing out and it's, and it's, it's not positive. And we need, with a, all the conversation that we've ha had along this morning, um, that message does come through to me in terms of we need to see this through. Mm. So we need to see how do we boost the economy, how do we create employment, so that we could come to years again where um, the, the SACO share is at levels where, um, w which we were, we were used to mm. uh, about three, four f years ago. Mr. Nelson, I'm very tempted to say, preach, sister, preach. <laughs> Mr. Nell, what we do know is we unfortunately cannot avoid spending, but it is ultimately pursuing productive spending. Please talk to us about the spending priorities of the Namibian government. Yeah, thanks. So, so I think James already told us in, in, in his speech as well that you can see that there's a 15% of our revenue goes to interest. Mm. So, so it is alarming. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about that uh, now. But uh, in terms of the development budget, only $5 billion allocated and operational budget, $65 billion. So, so quite a significant difference between the two. If we look at the makeup, um, personnel expenditure, about 46% still of, of the total budget. So, so it is high. It, uh, I think it's stabilized a bit, but it is still very high. Um, we've got subsidies and current transfers, which makes up a, a m big part of the budget. Uh, included there is transfers to, to NASFAF, to NAMRA, to, to NIPTB, NTA, TransNAMIP, uh, NBC, NAMPA, and NWR, uh, amongst others. It's not, it's not just them that gets that money, uh, but, but they, uh, they are included there. Um, we spoke about the interest and then an acquisition of capital assets, so that's something that, that's crept up a bit again. Uh, there's some budget for, for new furniture in there. There's, um, there's some, some upgrading in terms of construction when it comes to uh, p police uh, and home affairs. And then quite a significant amount is allocated for um, railway transport. So it's a construction of railway. We, we see that there's specific mention in the budget to, to reignite our ability to make it a logistics hub. And, and use that. And I think when we look at the hydrogen energy that, that we've spoken about, railway will, will, will form quite an important part of that as well. Um, so that's just a note. In terms of the allocations by department, so Ministry of Finance um, coming out on top there. Uh, remember included in there is, is the, the 9.2 billion of, of interest, so that's why it's, it's quite high. Um, and then we've got education, arts and culture coming in second, um, health and social services, defense, uh, home affairs. So pretty much the same picture as, as we've seen over, over the last number of years, not, not too much uh, difference there. When we look at what is actually in those different votes, uh, so in terms of health, uh, it's mainly focused on the continued fight against COVID. 
Uh, so, so, so there's some mention of that in the budget speech. And then in terms of finance, we've got the 9.2 billion of interest, but there's also a lot of talk about this contingency fund. Uh, so it's discretionary allocations over the next year and also over the next two to three years. And what's important to note here is that as far as we understand, um, those that money that's allocated in that discretionary fund, uh, it's, it's not m funds that's already committed necessarily. Uh, it's there to build in a buffer if something happens, uh, and it can be distributed amongst other votes. So during the mid-year budget speech, we, we saw the minister change uh, funds fr from the Ministry of Finance, for instance, and redeploy it somewhere else where it's needed. So, so that's why it seems high to give it to Ministry of Finance, but we must remember that there's that uh, discretionary element in there. Uh, in terms of the education, you've got UNAM, uh, NAST and NASFAF uh, getting quite a big portion of the money there. Um, public safety and order, we always see that every year that uh, that's part of, 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 of the top earners when it comes to, to spending priorities. And then, of course, the infrastructure. So for those of you traveling uh, a lot to the south, the uh, road between Marintal and Kietmans is on there to be upgraded. Mm. Um, RFA got 700 million, and there's also the road between, uh, so on in, in terms of Karabip and Isakos, I think, they're also upgrading. So, so some positive news in making sure that people can also travel safely. Um, just uh, as a side note, uh, each of you can can receive a copy of this afterwards. It's it's the publication issued by NMH. So everything that we talk here uh, is is in this publication. So there's you don't have to take a lot of notes. Uh, I see lots of people mm. writing. I don't know if they're writing. I don't know if they're writing or they're doing WhatsApps or whatever. But yeah. um, <laughs> the information will be will, will be in this publication. Before we proceed, allow me to, to be devil's advocate because ultimately the devil lies in the detail. Given the relative progress that we as a country are making in terms of fighting COVID-19, do you believe that what we are continuing to spend on COVID-19 through the Ministry of Health and Social Services is indeed justified? <laughs> I'm, com I'm being completely unfair and I own that. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's a difficult question then because the you've got two, two sides of, of the coin. A lot of people are, are for the spending. A lot of people are pro-vaccination. Other people say they're not anti-vaxxers. They just don't want to be forced to be vaccinated. Mm. Uh, so I don't want to get into a, a political debate about it. I think it's important that we spend the money to give people the opportunity to get vaccinated so we can return the economy. Whether people think that's justified, uh, it's, it's not my, it's, it's not my, my part to say. Mm. Uh, but I think we have to make sure that we do spend enough money uh, on making sure that um, people have the opportunity to get vaccinated and we, uh, th that the economy can return. I was going to clear my throat, but I'm not going to do it because I'm scared it might sound <laughs> like a dry cough. <laughs> yeah. Did we witness any new tax proposals as announced by the Minister of Finance yesterday afternoon? Sorry, just before I get to that, uh, mm. just in terms of expenditure execution rate, so we've seen historically that, that the um, government has been good in spending what's been allocated to them. Uh, up to the end of January, uh, the projection was that we're only spending 82% of the budget. So, mm. so this this can be a positive thing. We don't know what's happening in the last two months of the, of the financial year end. It could be that that uh, a few tenders are coming out now, or that people are start start to, to 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 buy aggressively in the last two months just to get to that budget. You know, uh, when we talk about marketing people, we never refer to a budget. We refer to a target. Um, because the budgets are there for finance people, but the rest of the people see it as a target to mm. it. So, so hopefully government is not seeing it as a target to it, uh, more of a budget to, um, to adhere to. But getting to the, to the tax uh, amendment, so again there was mention of, of the tax rates uh, for non-mining companies that's going to reduce. Um, I see South Africa has reduced their tax rate to 27% now, so we are quite far removed from w the 32% where we are currently at. Um, luckily, no new taxes was now introduced. Um, the minister correctly, I think, said that it's not the time now to introduce new taxes. The economy is already under pressure. I know the financial services industri industry was, was very worried about the proposed uh, withholding tax on, on dividends. The local mm. dividend has got a massive implication. And, and the lead time to change systems and, and to get used mm. to this is, is probably at least six months. So it's, it's very welcome that it wasn't um, introduced now. Uh, there's not an effective date on this, so I think in the speech it was indicated that anything that will penalize the economies, like the VAT on asset management fees or the, the local withholding tax, is, has been postponed. Um, there are uh, income tax and VAT amendment bills, sort of layman's drafts, that's out there to for commentary, and a lot of the, the clients here have given their, their input on that, and, and, and I'm uncomfortable that that's been uh, 
given to the Ministry of Finance, and hopefully it will have some favorable consideration. Uh, one thing that was mentioned is that if there's going to be tax changes, it will be something that will benefit uh, the taxpayer, and that's, for example, the 150,000 deduction uh, on the contributions for retirement, pension, and educational savings. Um, and, and Liberty, I know, is, is very um, keen on that as well. Uh, there was a, another broadcast we did with, with Warren uh, where, he, where he gave his view on it, so, so we're excited if that can come through. Um, luckily, it didn't come through now, uh, two days before year end, otherwise it will be complete chaos uh, at, at, at any of these retirement mm -hmm. savings places. Um, also in the VAT amendment bill was a zero rating of sanitary pads, so that is still on, on the cards. Um, no detail has been given yet about when this will be effective. Uh, an exciting thing is also the tax relief program, so the one that ended in January has now been extended for a further 12 months, so if you file your returns on ITAS, um, then there should be relief again in terms of your penalties and interest. Uh, we don't have the details yet, it's yet to be communicated, but a percentage of your penalties and interest will, will then be waived. It's also to encourage people to make use of ITAS, and we also want to encourage um, the viewers and, and the audience to make use of ITAS. Um, it, it is a nice system, it works most of the time, so um, it, it is really nice to file things quickly and you get assessed and everything is done. Mm -hmm. Um, then in terms of NAMRA, it's, it's rounding out the recruitment process, so what's nice about in the budget switch as well is they're saying that they're going to focus on the ease of paying taxes um, and, and, and increase compliance. So there's a not unfortunately a lot of non-compliance in the country. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think we need to be careful about making compliant people more compliant because a lot of us are compliant, and but you get a lot of flack and a lot of admin trying to, to remain compliant whereas you've got a lot of other businesses that's not compliant. And I think the focus should shift to how do we get those people in the net uh, and not make it more difficult for the people that are compliant to stay compliant. Um, Follow my eyes, don't look now. <laughs> 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 yeah, so I think Denver, that, that, that's enough from me. Thank you very much. Mr. Silman, I'm not alleging that Namibia is a sinful nation, but a matter that affects many households in this country, of course, relates to excise duties. Yes. What does the picture look like in terms of sin taxes? Yes, so that dissect, that's been given to us with the read of the South African budget speech and already effective as we speak. That's by the 23rd of February. Um, so in interesting to note is that prior to the tabling of the SA budget speech, I did note um, a lot of um, lobbying in that space um, towards SACO and given, giving consideration as to the expected percentage increase. For example, last year, across board on these commodities, the increase was uh, 8%. Um, so this year is quite, um, yeah, so it's um, um, is 6%, 5% ranges, but well below the 8% of last year. So it seems that the lobbying did have some positive spin. But on a lighter note, to conclude from our side, Denver, um, don't worry for tonight's braai. These increases are not yet on the goods on the shelf as we speak. They are yet to be manufactured and imported, but, we, uh, but very soon it will hit the pocket. I don't take any of that, but on behalf of my fellow Namibians, I did this. <laughs> Thank you very much, PwC, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, for your contribution. Madame Hamunime, <laughs> it's lovely to be in your company once again. Please, in layperson's terms, help us understand what is the state of the Namibian economy and to what extent did this economic climate affect government's finances? Awesome. Thank you so much for the question, and thanks for having me. Let me just get my slides on. So in terms of uh, the state of the economy, it's essentially been two years since the onset of the pandemic and close to six years since the Namibian economy came close to recessionary territory. Um, however, despite that, and despite the fact that much of the economy was very hard hit by the restrictions that were imposed last year in response to the country's third wave, the domestic economy is actually projected to have grown. Yesterday, when the budget was tabled, the Ministry of Finance actually projected that the economy grew by 1.2%. Um, and this is a significant recovery from the 8.5% contraction, which was witnessed in uh, 2020. 
going forward, uh, the expectation largely is that we are expecting for growth to continue to pick up. And this is according to projections coming from both the Bank of Namibia and also Ministry of Finance. So the projection for 2022 is essentially that uh, we'll see the economy recover or growth pick up to 2.9%, uh, I believe. And then in 2023, it's expected to come up to 3.7%. And much of this growth really will, will be supported by, you know, easing COVID-19 restrictions and also a lot of recoveries we're seeing across uh, most of our sectors. However, with that said, I think it's still quite important to highlight the fact that, you know, much of the, the recoveries we're seeing is really coming uh, it's really coming about due to the low base that was actually created by the pandemic. Um, and so when it comes to talking about the fiscus and talking about government finances, the risks are still very, very much real. Uh, we know that in 2020, the government's uh, budget was significantly impacted by the pandemic, and we saw expenditure jump up quite significantly. So during that year, we know that the government, between 2019 and 2020, actually had to increase the budget by 4.6 billion. And I mean, this was a short run, uh, you know, mechanism that they put in place, primarily to support the most uh, negatively impacted industries and also to support the most vulnerable members of our society. But the net effect of that in terms of our budget deficit is that it increased from being at about 5% to 8%. And at the same time, the public, um, public debt also increased from 56 to 62% uh, as a percentage of GDP. And so it's fair to say that the pandemic uh, really kind of disrupted the fiscal consolidation stance that the government did have previously. Um, and the reason why I bring this up is because, you know, in the current context, we only have 14% of the population fully vaccinated. So the risk that this actually presents to uh, the economy is that we could potentially have another surge in infections. And so this could mean that obviously the growth outlook would be dampened. Um, and this will have negative implications on revenue. Um, and from an expenditure side, in the worst case scenario, we could see again that the government needs to wrap up expenditure in the short run. Um, and so this is you know, the current situation that we're facing and these are the risks that are still prevalent within the economy. Thank you. We sincerely hope that we won't see mm -hmm. another surge in infections that we, we can't afford it. Ms. Kluter, the head of state in his New Year's address themed 2022 the year of re-imaging. Mr. Pumbushimi yesterday was clear that his focus for this year's budget is about the youth. What do you make of his theme for the budget? Thank you for the question, Denver, and good morning, everybody. I agree with Johan. It's awesome to see real faces in front of us again. Um, Denver, I'm, a, I'm, I'm sitting with my learned colleagues, and I'm a very simple person. So for me, I looked at the budgets and I said, okay, there's, there's money going towards education. Um, obviously, uh, quite a big portion, the, the largest portion of the budget. Um, and, and for me, that's important, right? Because we've got to protect our future Namibians. We have to ensure that we've got the right skills coming through um, for the to secure our future. Um, so, so that is always top priority for me, and to see the investment going into that, and I suppose some of the thoughts around um, how does that education system change over time? Because the education that, that you and I got, Chantel, not as youths anymore, um, is very different to what our youth actually needs going forward. So, you know, investment into how that changes, thoughts around the education system changes going forward as well to allow for these new skills that our people need. Um, and Nelson mentioned it as a, as a key success factor for Singapore as well. So, so that talks to me. Um, healthcare talks to me. I know you and Johan mentioned that earlier, so I won't get into the, into the, the touchy debate. Um, but I think it's important that we do make available vaccinations for our people. Um, I think we've seen the impact during last year, particularly um, the, the strain that our healthcare sector took. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's a, a positive move as well. And then the other thing is, as Namibians, we've got to feel safe. Um, because that protects our, our people, it protects an outflow of skills, um, and, and not just for ourselves, but even for our tourists. That, and we want them to feel welcome. We saw articles recently of our tourists saying, well, we don't want to go to Namibia. Mm. The vaccination rate is too low. Should we be exposing ourselves? And I think those are, those are challenges to each and every one of us as Namibians, to say, how do we play our part in terms of helping this economy recover? 
And um, yeah, so I, th I think that that call from the minister as well to increase our vaccination rates, um, as Nafiku's mentioned, 14 and a half percent, we are lagging um, our counterparts even in the region. Mm. Um, so, so I think those are, are some of the the um, challenges that we face, and I I like the fact that there is that focus on it in the current budget. No one's safe until everyone's safe. Agreed. Yeah. What is concerning, notwithstanding the large and significant investment in education, is that about 80% of the Ministry of Education, Arts and Culture's budget goes towards salaries. And we know that is a sensitive matter and that is indeed a prevailing bone of contention. Ms. Hamunime, Ms. Nell really touched on revenue. From your perspective, please talk to us more about government's revenue outlook. Thank you so much uh, for the question. So I don't want to delve too much into the numbers because I know uh, Johanna has already gone there. But in terms of revenue, I think one of the key things that we've noticed is that definitely over the past few years, several lines of government revenue have come under pressure. Um, and so essentially the result of that is that we've seen uh, revenue as a percentage of GDP actually come down from being at about 32.5% in 2020 um, to uh, 30, sorry, to 28.6% in 2021. However, I think the positive development that has been touched on is the fact that the revenue outlook is expected to pick up quite significantly. So between last year and now, we're expecting for revenue to actually increase by about 11%. And as was mentioned earlier, this is effectively um, six billion. This is effectively a six billion increase, um, and much of that uh, is really going to be coming out of non-tax revenue, as was mentioned previously. So it will really be the proceeds coming out of the listing or the partial listing of MTC. Um, in as well as the dividends which will come from diamond mining companies, the likes of Namdia, Deb Marine, and also Namdev, um, in addition to dividends by NPTH. So essentially, uh, the revenue outlook is uh, looking quite good. Uh, but I think something that is important to note maybe is when it comes to looking at specific uh, revenue lines. We have noted that there, ha there has been pressure that's been put on revenue coming from the Southern African Customs Union. Um, and that was something that was already mentioned. And so uh, we've noted that it has come down by about 33% between 2020 and uh, 2021. And we're expecting for this current budget that it will continue to decline by just under 600 million, I believe. And it's really only from 2023 onwards that I, we're expecting any kind of recovery when it comes to SACO. And obviously this is because it is a function of economic activity within the region and it's only then that we're expecting for the post-COVID recovery really to pick up steam. However, when it comes to looking at, at other revenue lines within the budget, for example, um, domestic tax, domestic taxes on goods and services, which essentially speaks to VAT. Um, this is one that has picked up quite considerably since 2020. And that's largely because we haven't had the very strict lockdowns that we experienced during that year. And it's a similar thing when it comes to taxes on incomes and, sorry, taxes on uh, income and profits, which combined is um, the largest uh, contributor towards government revenue. Um, but I think the key, sorry, the key thing in terms of revenue is just to look at the trend. Uh, we are expecting for it to continue to pick up going into next year and the year after that. Uh, but maybe not a concern so much, but it is quite important to note that much of that growth and that uptick will really depend on the domestic economy being able to perform. There's several lines of government revenue that actually are reliant on the economy. And so should that growth not materialize, um, we're not sure, I'm not sure, if we'll actually see revenue actually increase to those levels. Sure. One of the issues that you flagged earlier about what the pandemic also did amongst a host of many things is that it in fact disrupted government's fiscal consolidation strategy. What does the expenditure trends look like from your perspective? Yeah, so I mean, in terms of expenditure, um, when the government had to ramp up uh, expenditure so drastically in 2020, essentially what we saw was that expenditure jumped as a percentage of GDP to 40%. And the last time we saw it actually being at such high levels was in 2015, um, right before the fiscal consolidation started. Um, however, we saw that in 2021, it did actually come down to 37%, uh, and we are expecting for that to fall further to 35%. 
asset. Um, so that, that is positive in terms of um, where expenditure is going to be as a percentage of GDP. However, there are some concerns, and some of them have been noted already when it comes to looking at expenditure. And I think for me personally, one of the key, I guess, surprises from yesterday's budget was noting the fact that expenditure for 2022 was actually revised upwards by $2.5 billion uh, in comparison to what was actually shown at the major budget review in November last year. And so that is a, a concern. And second to that is also how much is actually being allocated towards personal expenditure. We saw last year in the major budget review, it was um, revised upwards. And in addition to that, we also saw that there were um, reallocations made where the development budget was actually revised downwards. And so when you're in a situation essentially where we can see that the trend generally is for uh, total expenditure to increase, but the development budget to come down, that essentially means that we are actually spending more on operational needs. And so that is a, c a concern. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, majority of this is really going towards personnel expenditure. And that, that was a lot of the revisions and the reallocations we saw take place last year. Um, and I guess coming back to just speaking to general trends when it comes to expenditure, we are noting that it's set to increase from uh, 70 billion in 2022 to 73 billion in 2023, and then eventually reach 76 billion. Mm -hmm. So the key question when I was really looking at the numbers yesterday was, I was asking myself, are we still you know, kind of following the fiscal consolidation path? Um, and second to that is also, how will this actually affect our public debt? And how will it affect our ability to actually service that debt? So in terms of expenditure, I think that's roughly the view from, from my side. Very well. Ms. Kluter, one of the matters that we're still holding our breath around, as we heard earlier, is that tax relief measures are still being pursued through the Income Tax Amendment Bill. And it's a matter that also will affect the industry in which you are operating. How do you foresee that playing out? Um, thanks, Denver. So the, the additional um, tax deductibility on contributions towards retirement um, edu and education policies Moving from 40,000 to 150,000 is actually quite a, it, it, it's a, it's quite a big impact on an individual. And we're quite excited about this because obviously in, in this industry, very often you see quite heartbreaking cases of people retiring with insufficient funds, not enough to sustain yourself on a monthly basis. Um, and, and that's quite a challenge for us. So, so I think it's important that we do have this type of relief measure. Um, we do see consumers obviously under pressure at the moment. Um, I think this is aimed at a sort of higher income bracket than um, your sort of low to middle income uh, type consumer. So I think I'd like to see some growth in national savings come out of that. Um, it is money, it's, it's in, in essence a deferment of your income from now to later. And we are living in a time of instant gratification. People want what they want and they want it now. So I think that's a challenge for us as industry as well as to, to make a deferment of income still look attractive. Um, I, I think that's a challenge that, that lays before our door. Um, when you are young, retirement seems like very far away we're all bulletproof, nothing can happen to me, so why do I need to think about it? But it's actually at the point where you can make the largest difference for yourself. Um, so, so we welcome it. I think the other piece to it is what will the effect be on the benefits that are actually being paid out of these funds? Being able to save so much, we still have a piece of legislation that says if you um, have a benefit in excess of 50000 a million dollars, and you are in a pension fund, you're compelled to purchase an annuity with it. And what does an annuity mean um, at 50,000 Namibian dollars for the rest of your life? So I think that's something that perhaps needs to be looked at as well to say, if, we s if we're able to save so much, we've got to look at the benefit side of it as well. Mm. Thank you very much. Madam Aminime, I think there's resounding consensus about the trajectory of our public debt, of course, and the deficit. What is it that we need to do now to manage that trajectory? Yeah, so I think uh, I already spoke to this earlier, but in terms of where um, you know our budget deficit is sitting, and just maybe to expand or explain for people who aren't familiar, um, our 
budget balance is essentially a function of both revenue and expenditure. And so wh when you're in a situation where revenue is exceeding expenditure, obviously you'll be in a, a budget surplus, but if it's the other way around, then you're in a budget deficit. And Namibia has been sitting in a bu budget deficit for a number of years, and it's only very few years that we've actually managed to achieve a surplus. At the moment, the budget deficit is, or f let me say previously in 2021, the budget deficit was sitting at about 16 billion, and so that was a, at about 8.6% of uh, GDP. Now, coming into the current budget that was tabled yesterday, uh, we are actually expecting for the budget deficit to come down uh, to 5.6%, I believe. And this will largely be because we're seeing um, the revenue outlook improve so significantly during this year. Um, and so uh, going forward, we're expecting for the budget balance to s roughly stay at uh, about 5%, but that is contingent on revenue actually being able to perform. And obviously that's also based on the economy's performance. Now, should the growth that we're anticipating not ma materialize, not only will we see the budget deficit increase, but we'll also see um, public debt uh, increase. And at the moment, and I think that this was already touched on previously, um, we're expecting for public debt to increase to 71%. And remember, this is at twice the levels that the government, or the threshold that the government had set itself of 35%. Mm. And we are expecting by the end of the MTEF, public debt will most likely be at 75%. And so that is quite significant. And I think from an economic perspective, if you're looking at uh, the public debt increasing so significantly, we also have to take into consideration consideration what our expectations are for interest rates. Uh, in Namibia, and I think globally, we're expecting for interest rates to rise. Um, within the Namibian context, I think by the end of the year, the expectation is that interest rates should go up by about 100 basis points cumulatively. Um, and so the question there really is, how is that going to affect our debt servicing costs? Um, because as a country, you don't want to be in a position, and where we currently are, revenue is growing, but it's growing slowly, and then we have you know, interest rates picking up and then de debt servicing also picking up significantly. So I think the main situation we want to avoid is being in a place where we're taking up more and more of our budget to service our debt and then eventually we might even reach a point where this is crowding in on operational expenditure and that's not what we want to achieve. And so this is why the emphasis is really being placed on moving away from consumptive activities towards productive projects that will actually be able to generate revenue and be able to you know, not only tackle the, the budget deficit, but also debt and reduce um, the interest payments we have to make. I have a question. Do you ever bring us good news? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying, I'm trying. <laughs> Very well. Ms. Kluter, as we round up our conversation, part of the announcements that we are keeping our fingers crossed about is a hopeful reduction in further debt accumulation because much of our revenue is already tied up in servicing the existing debt. If that happens, if that manifests and materializes, will it be enough a measure? Um, I think that's a tough one to say, will it be enough? I think we looked at, um, Johan showed us the split of the operational um, expenditure budget versus development. And, and I think that's so key. So again, Denver, I'm simple. Um, my economics notes from Varsity said to me, consumers need to be strong, government needs to be strong, and investment needs to be strong to grow the economy. At the moment, if we look at consumers, consumers are just as indebted, or sorry, I was going to say just as indebted as government, <laughs> but probably much more than that. Mm. Um, if we look at an indicator of consumer health, um, we're talking about vehicle sales that are sluggish, um, approved building plans are slow, much slower than what they have been in the past. So we're seeing, um, I, I took a walk with my kids through the mall the other day and I, there's so many stores that are closed. Um, you know, nobody's opening soon even. Mm. So you're just seeing these colorful pictures on the windows and the malls. Um, and that tells me that, that consumers are under pressure and consumers are not able to spend um, the way that we need them to. So, so I think there's a challenge to um, consumers as well, and each and every one of us as Namibians, to say, how do we better equip ourselves so that we can generate this additional growth for the economy through our spending on local activities, like Chantel called us to do mm. earlier? Um, we understand that government is, is constrained at the moment as well, servicing at 15%, as you mentioned. Um, that's quite a challenge. 
So um, how do we get additional spending from, from government when the operational expenditure versus development is, is very heavily leaned towards um, the operational budget? So, so we're sitting in a bit of a precarious situation there. And, but what was exciting for me is that we've got the opportunity to generate this foreign direct investment with the new projects that we've seen. Um, I, I was actually quite energized after listening to James this morning and hearing some of the, the big plans that government has got. Um, so I think that uh, that's really an avenue that we've got to explore. Um, and, and I think he was quite practical as well when he said it's the same for each and every one of us. We all manage our personal budgets as the same for government. Revenue minus expenses equals some sort of profit. Um, and, and I think that's the, the simple piece that we've got, to, we've got to pay attention to. Bearing in mind that James can bottle the wind of Ludritz and sell it to the Buchter. Ex yeah. Sell it to them. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. and Thank you for sharing your expertise. Ms. Kluta, I would like you to remain on stage. The rest will excuse you in a bit. Dear viewer, we'll take a short break. We will be right back. Namibia and its cities are seen as one of the cleanest countries in Africa. Plastic pollution is a big problem. Therefore, it's up to each of us to do what we can to reduce the use of plastic, especially single-use plastic bags. At Liberty Life Namibia, we've taken the decision to turn all our old branding items into reusable shopping bags. It's a way in which we can drive sustainability and look after our most important stakeholder, our environment. If you also believe in sustainability and would like more information, please get in touch. Liberty Life Namibia. In it with you. We were taught that one plus one equals two. Simple, right? But today's world isn't simple. So, what happens if we look at it from a new angle? Could we make something greater? If we bring together human ingenuity, passion, and experience with the latest technology, we start to make something more. Something we can see in people's lives and feel in the world around them. Building trust for today and tomorrow. And that's the thing. We all know the math. But we need a new way to put it together. which means we don't just find answers. We never stop looking for them. A passionate community of solvers coming together in unexpected ways, creating new solutions for a new day. That's the new equation. No matter the time, there's a way to keep it cashless and pay with PayPal's instead. Start your day the cashless way. No electricity for your morning cup, no stress. Just grab your phone and PayPal has got you back and brewing in seconds. Out of the house and need to fill up with no cash? No problem with PayPal, because now you're paying cashless on the go. Then it's a quick visit for car wash and kapana, and now you don't need anything more than your phone to pay. Or just sort out your TV subscription the cashless way and chill out on the couch at home. And whether you're paying for medicine, groceries, or just your municipal bills at the end of the month, why not make it more convenient with PayPal instead? For every day and a million other reasons, isn't it time you went cashless and changed the way you pay? Download the PayPal's app 
or dial star 140 star 6626 hash on your phone to get started. Pay Pulse. Change the way you pay. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, both our virtual audience and the in-person delegates. We're approaching the end of the Namibian budget 2022-2023 dissect under the theme Reform to Grow. Now this lady modestly refers to herself as simple, but she is indeed a powerful tour de force. Let's put our hands together for the vote of thanks by Ms. Monique Kluter, Managing Director of Liberty Life. I will stand upon all the protocol that has been observed this morning. Good morning, everybody. Denver, I don't think I've ever felt so good about myself. Thank you very much for that introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, members of the media, it's always a privilege for me to be involved in such rigorous debate um, around our nation's growth agenda. And it's my pleasure to deliver the vote of thanks this morning. I know that I stand between you and potentially your next meeting or breakfast for the viewers at home, maybe that next cup of coffee, so I'll be brief. I'd like to begin by acknowledging our guest speaker, Mr. James Manupi, and to thank him for speaking to us today and sharing key insights into the growth opportunities that lay ahead for us as a nation. What an invigorating conversation around what our success could look like. Uh, he reinforced the challenge that's been laid before private sector so many times before. As a nation, we need more public-private partnerships, and not necessarily from the point of view of just financial investment, but he's looking for skills. We all sit in our roles, and we've been placed there as a result of the skills that we bring. Why not share that with our nation? Let's put our hands up to form part of this very practical way forward that, he, that is presented for us today. To my fellow panelists and the Master of Ceremonies, Denver Kisting, Ms. Chantal Hisselman, Mr. Johan Nell, um, Nafiku Humi Hamunime, apologies. Thank you for the honest discussion. It's always energizing to be in a room with people that share the same passion about their respective industries. An event like this is truly a reminder of the importance of partnerships. So to all the sponsors that made today possible, PwC, Standard Bank, Liberty Life, and Namibia Media Holdings, we're thankful for all the work that has gone into this event. To all the organizers and the teams that worked to compile this event, um, such a detailed and comprehensive event, thank you for your tireless efforts. Finally, to our guests, thank you for joining us this morning, for making the time to be with us. We hope that you enjoyed the discussions, the morning session, and we trust that the event has been insightful and beneficial for you. Before I go, um, Nelson so eloquently positioned it this morning. Let us remember that we have every reason to be grateful that we are where we find ourselves today. Others around the world are sitting in a very different position. So let's remember particularly the youth that our minister spoke about so passionately yesterday who are stuck in the Ukraine, facing the middle of a storm at the moment. Let us remember our Namibians who are in the same position. And let us steel ourselves for the impact that each and every one of us will face. We are not an island. As we leave, please travel safely and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you for your time. I don't know whether it's customary to thank the person responsible for the vote of thanks, but she did such a sterling job. Let's give her another round of applause.
Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of Namibian budget 2022-2023 dissect reform to grow. Thank you very much for being an amazing in-person audience. Thank you for the viewers at home, in their offices and elsewhere. Please let's heed the call by Mr. James Nupe, economic advisor in the presidency, namely to put on our proudly Namibian hats and a hat that is innovative and of a problem-solving nature. Goodbye. Ladies and gentlemen, should you not be aware of this very important fact, there is a wonderful breakfast available.